Shalom. My name is Adam, and I welcome you to the parable of the vineyard. Every day, Yahuwah is waking up a remnant, a group of people who are coming out of deceptions, realizing our walk is to consist of faith and obedience to His righteous commands. Each week, we read through and examine a portion of the Torah, allowing the Spirit of the Most High to guide, teach, and open our eyes and ears to the wondrous matters out of His law. Join us as we seek to be refined by His Word, preparing ourselves for the return of our King of Kings, being faithful and obedient, walking in His way, truth, and life. Shabbat Shalom and welcome back brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Parable of the Vineyard YouTube live stream of our Torah portion reading. My name is Adam, your host, and I welcome you. This is week 21, Key to Zay, which is Exodus 30, verse 11 through 34, 35. A lot to be discussed on this one. I know I say that every time, but this one literally has so many different topics uh, over uh, over this Torah portion. So I'm not going to delay with talking about anything other than let's give praise to him and let's get started. Let's pray. Let's bow our hearts. Heavenly Father, Yahuwah Most High, we come before you and bless you and praise you in Messiah Yahushua's name. Thank you for sending your Son, your Word, for our healing, our atonement, our reconciliation, Father. And we thank you for opening our eyes and ears to your Word, to your Torah in these last days, to walk the way that you've commanded us to walk. And we found, in, in doing so, Father, we found rest for our souls. Father, we just pray that you would guide us with your Ruach HaKodesh, and of wisdom and understanding as we go through your Torah portion, that we may glean and do what's right in your sight. In Yahushua's name, we say Amen, and Hallelujah, and Shabbat Shalom. Best day of the week, is it not? Okay, let's uh, let's get started. And we are going to be in Exodus 30, verse 11. Actually, I didn't do the, I didn't do the shofar. Let's do the shofar. Okay, here we are. Here we are at Exodus 30, verse 11. We're going to be reading from the Sefer version. However, we're also going to be cross-referencing the Aramaic and many other books. Because that's just what we do here. If In case you're new, in case you're just coming across this, you're like, uh, what's this all about? What we do is we read the Torah portion each week, and we seek to glean whatever we can uh, relating to our walk. And I conduct this in a manner that if we are all hanging out in my living room, reading it together, and just sharing with you my notes over, well, really this has been over the last couple of years now. So, and what's cool is, what's really neat is every year we do this, I feel like Abba just gives us more and more and more and allows us to grow. Like, think about it. How many of you out there have read the same book, the same chapter, the same verse multiple times, dozens of times, however many times, and like, one, then there's that one time you read it and you're like, oh, where you been? Where you been all my life? Okay, here we go. Enough for me. Exodus 30, verse 11. We're going to read about the census tax, also known as the temple tax. And Yahweh spoke unto Moshe, saying, When you take the sum of the children of Yashrael after their number, then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto Yahuwah. <clears throat> when you number them, that there be no plague among them when you number them. That's kind of interesting especially when we consider like the 144,000 a little bit later. This they shall give everyone that passes among them that are numbered half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. A shekel is 20 giras. A half shekel shall be the offering of Yahuwah. Everyone that passes among them that are numbered from 20 years old and above shall give an offering unto Yahuwah. The rich shall not give more and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel when they give an offering unto Yahuwah to make an atonement for your souls. And you shall take the atonement money of the children of Yisrael, and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of the assembly, that it may be a memorial unto you, unto you, the children of Yisrael, before Yahuwah to make atonement for your souls. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, where, right? Where have we seen this 
temple tax before. Let's read about it. Matthew 17, 24 through 27. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received the tribute money came to Peter and said, Does not your master pay tribute? And he says, Yes. And when he was come into the house, Yahusha prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Peter? I like the love of the KGB in this. What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take customer tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? Peter says unto him, Of strangers? Yahushua said unto him, Then are the children free. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go you to the sea and cast a hook and take up the fish that first comes up. And when you have opened his mouth, you shall find a piece of money that take and give unto them for me and for you. <clears throat> so we, we saw here earlier that uh, the temple tax was half a shekel, right? And uh, he got one, basically one shekel. And it was for both of them. So some cool things to glean from that. Number one, well, Yahusha, let's just talk about it. I mean, Yahusha, we know, <laughs> he miraculously, you know, provides the atonement money. Because remember, this um, this money was a ransom for his soul, right? Uh, this shall be an offering to Yah, and you shall take the atonement money. And we see here that Messiah Yahusha miraculously provides that atonement money for him and for Peter. First Peter 13 through 22. First Peter 1, 13 through 22. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation, the, re the revealing of Yahushua HaMashiach. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because when it is written, be holy for I am holy, or be you set apart because I'm set apart. And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed, like right now, we are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation or <clears throat> tradition received, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Messiah as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in Elohim that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in Elohim, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. But the point is, is we're not redeemed this way anymore by giving a shekel, half a shekel to the temple for atonement, for redeeming. And that's what Peter's making this distinction. <clears throat> you know, why he would call this a vain conversation received by the tradition of your fathers, because I mean, this is not really tradition, because this is Torah. However, he's making a distinction now, however, that we are not atoned for and redeemed by this, uh, this mere act of a temple tax anymore that it is by the blood of Messiah, who is our spotless lamb. So it's like when we look through the Torah, we can see all these different foreshadows of Messiah, even this census tax. And that's why I think we see that portion here in Matthew 17, right, where he miraculously provides that for himself and for Peter. Pretty interesting. But <clears throat> when thinking about how this has changed, right, that it goes from... This, this half a shekel to Messiah it makes me think of some of the words of Paul that sometimes are very hard to understand, especially the book of Galatians. But wherefore then serves the law? So wh why why the law? It was added because of transgressions, right? Well, they wouldn't have needed atonement money if atonement wasn't needed, right? Because there was transgressions. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. So, Right? Paul's making this distinction that things like this, things like this temple tax, right, was there in place until the seed should come. The same distinction that Peter gave us. Hebrews 10, 25 through 30, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Praise Yah, we get to do that here together, especially those of you that are watching live. But exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. If you don't have local fellowship, it's time to find some.
For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, the Torah, there remains no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' Torah died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much more sober punishment suppose ye shall be he thought worthy, who has trodden underfoot the son of Elohim, and has counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and has done despite unto the Spirit of grace. So it's like Messiah didn't slack the law. Like he made it, you know, there's more to it now in a good way, right? He magnified the Torah, right? And how much sore punishment would we be counted if we're like, oh, yeah, you know, we're we're saved by grace through faith. So why don't we, you know, why do we need to do the Torah anymore? Why do we need to do the, the Sabbath anymore? Why do we need to do the feast days anymore? You know, those teachings, those teachings are satanic. Let's just be honest. It's doctrines of demons, of devils. That's not what Messiah taught. For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongs unto me. I will recompense, says Yahweh. And again, Yahweh will judge his people. So, just something to consider, uh, again, to glean out of this. Yahushua pays our ransom, our atonement. Um, what's interesting, the 144,000 are counted, right? And their ransom is paid. Think about it. Because there is no more temple tax. Because it says, they can't be numbered without it. <clears throat> Right, so when you take the son of the children of Yashrael after their number, then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto Yahuwah when you number them, that there be no plague among them when you number them. So when the people are numbered, right, this has to be collected. We see the 144,000 are numbered. Well, they have this atonement. The reason I'm saying this is because some of the teachings out there say that the 144,000 are um, Jews that don't believe in Messiah and then they'll get converted when they become 144,000. There's just, there's some wild things out there, wild theories out there. So just wanted to mention that. Uh, also, um, we see that there's this separation um, with this. So let's take a look at this as well. Ezekiel 30, 34 through 38. And I will bring you out from the people, and I will gather you out of the countries wherein you are scattered, with a mighty hand, with a stretched out arm, and with fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people, and there will I plead with you face to face. Like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so will I plead with you, says Yahweh Elohim. And, right, they were numbered before they came out. And I will cause you to pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. So very similar storyline as we see coming out of Egypt, then brought into the covenant. Once again, we're going to be brought out of Egypt and be brought into the covenant. And I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me. I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn, and they shall not enter into the land of Israel, or really it'll be New Jerusalem, and you shall know that I am Yahuwah. Malachi three sixteen through 18 Then they that feared Yahuwah spake often one to another, and Yahuwah hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared Yahuwah and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, says Yahuwah Sebaot, and the day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son that serves him. So going back and thinking about, or actually, let me just finish. Then shall you return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serves Elohim and him that serves him not. So going back to that Hebrews 10 passage, where when we you know have the knowledge of the truth, we know Messiah is the truth, we know the word, the Torah is the truth. So when we receive the knowledge of him, and continue in sin, there's, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. There's no more uh, atonement. There's no more um, uh, atonement money paid for us at that point. And that's when he's going to make that separation between people that serve him, really, and don't serve him. Because just believing that our Father exists and that he sent his Son to die for us, is that really believing? Because, man, there was a really good TikTok that was shared the other day. This the sister was like, I, I believe in the devil, or that there's I believe that there's a devil and there's there's demons. Does that make me a Satanist? No. So we're saying because we believe in God, our Father Yahuwah, and we believe in His Son Yahusha, that makes us followers of Him. That we really believe in Him. I'm butchering it, but you get what I'm saying. We have to show this belief by our works. Faithful. The just shall the 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 just shall live by faith, or faithfulness really is the true Hebrew word that was used there. Alright. Let's keep going. What was interesting here 
Verse 14, it said, Everyone that passes among them that are numbered from 20 years old and upwards shall give an offering to Yahuwah. You know, there's a lot of questions out there. What is the age of accountability? Like, you know, a lot of us have, have children and, and whatnot, and we're thinking to ourselves, what age are they when they're accountable to themselves? Some would say maybe when they leave the house, um, but maybe there really is an age. You know, modern-day Judaism, it's 13, but I don't agree with that. Um, you know, when they... Well, anyways... But here in the Torah, this might be the closest thing that we have to give us an idea of what the age of accountability is. That's how they were numbered, 20 and above. The ones that can go into also the army, 20 and above. So, something to consider, for sure. Okay. Um, what's interesting here, also verse 15, The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel, when they give an offering unto Yahuwah to make an atonement for your souls. Uh-oh. My internet's out. Let's try that again here in a second. Oh. Okay, let's try that again. Nope. Sorry, y'all. My internet is giving me some issues. So, let's see here. So, the rich shall not get more. So, it's interesting that, you know, it doesn't matter who we are. We have, we each have our own, um, we each have to give what's required for the temple, for the building of the temple, for the sustainment of the temple. First Peter 2, five. you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to Elohim through Yahushua HaMashiach. So we ourselves are literally part of the greater temple, the new Jerusalem. Uh, Revelation 3 talks about the Church of Philadelphia. Those people will be literally pillars in the temple, right? So... We are when so when it comes to this temple, we're all equal, rich or poor, male or female, free or bond, as as Paul says. So we're all equal. Matthew twenty three eight through twelve. So when it comes to Yahweh's house, we're all equal. We know there's other things like rewards and crowns and like that, but when it comes to being in His kingdom or being part of His kingdom or the building up of His kingdom, we're all equal, right? It doesn't matter. Like Paul says, we're one body with many members one part may seem more important than the other but it doesn't matter that's not how it works we're all we all have this part to play big or small even if our role publicly seems bigger than someone's role who's very small and private it doesn't matter they're both equally as important and that makes me think of why everybody had to give the same amount it also reminds me of the parable of the workers in the field how some of them worked all day and bore the brunt of the the heat of the day and the people came in at the last second in the last you know hour and worked and they were all paid the same wage right so just as they were all paid the same wage you know when it comes to building the the temple or working for the kingdom you know we all uh you know we all have the same um you know standing in yas in yas sight if that makes sense i hope i'm not talking in circles but matthew 23 8 through 12 but be not called rabbi right or master for one is your master even messiah and you're all brethren Right. So he's like he's leveling the playing field. Right. Even though there's leadership and things like that, it doesn't matter. Like on a scale of importance or whatnot, equal. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither you be called masters, for one is your master, even Messiah. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Right? So that's why I'm also always typically weary of people that are boastful, like I'm this, like I'm that. Um, we shouldn't ever be exalting ourselves because at the end of the day, we're all equal. We're all equal in Yah's eyes as far as our standing in the kingdom. Again, there's, there is something else with rewards and things like that. But as being a, a standing in his kingdom, Messiah says, I'm here and you all are here. That's it. That's how it works. And that's how we should act and treat each other. All right, so let's keep going, y'all. All right, so the bronze basin, Exodus 30, 17. And Yahweh spoke unto Moshe, saying, You shall also make a laver of brass, and his foot also of brass, to wash withal. And you shall put it between the tabernacle of the assembly and the altar, and you shall put water therein. 
for Aharon and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. When they go into the tabernacle of the assembly, they shall wash with water that they die not. Or when they come near to the altar to minister to burn offer to burn offering, to burn offerings made unto un, by fire unto Yahuwah. So shall they wash their hands and their feet that they die not, and it shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and to his seed throughout their generation. So let's talk about this. So we think about before they can enter into the tabernacle right, and serve, they got to wash their hands and feet. What was this? Maybe a foreshadow of and a symbol of. So before a priest could really minister, he had to be washed. Makes us think of baptisms, right? What else? There's a couple other things to think about. What about this one? John 13, 1 through 7. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Yahushua knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Yahushua, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from Elohim and went to Elohim, he, rise, he rose from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then came he to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Master, do you wash my feet? Yahushua answered and said to him, What I do you know not now, but you shall know hereafter. Peter said unto him, You shall never wash my feet. Yahushua answered him, If I wash you not, you have no part with me. And remember, Messiah Yahushua was part of the order of the um, the priesthood of Melchizedek. And he was renewing the covenant and anointing a new generation to be kings and priests. Back how it was in in Exodus 19, 5 through 6. Where he's like, I want you to be a king. To, yeah, if you obey my voice right, and hear my words, you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. Right? So he's washing them. If I wash you not, you have no part with me. You know, I can't be part of my ministry, right? Part of my, my kingdom. Simon Peter said unto him, Master, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Yahushua said unto him, He that is washed needs not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And you are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet, he had taken his garments and was set down again and said unto them, Know you what I have done unto you? You call me Master and Adonai, and you say, Well, for so I am. If then... Your master and Adonai have washed your feet. You also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done unto you. Verily I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his master, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. First Peter three twenty one. the like figure we're into, even baptism does not also save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward Elohim by the resurrection of Yahusha HaMashiach. And I don't know why I didn't put it in here. Uh, also, let's get a little Romans 6 in here. Um, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Elohim forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Yahushua HaMashiach, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Messiah was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in a newness of life. Praise Yah. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. First John 3, 4 tells us that transgression of the Torah is sin. Right? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Elohim forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? We shouldn't live any longer in sin. Okay. So, right? These priests had to wash before coming into the tabernacle. Right? We've been washed by the blood of Messiah. We've been washed by baptism. And, you know, the yearly in this Passover, we should wash each other's feet. We should do this. So, all right, the anointing oil and incense. Moreover, Yahuwah spoke unto Moshe, saying, Take also unto the principal spices of pure myrrh 500 shekels, and of sweet cinnamon half so much, even 250 shekels, and of sweet calamus, we'll talk about that in a second, 250 shekels, and of cassia 500 shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary, and of oil, olive, a hen. And he shall make it an 
oil of holy ointment and ointment compound after the art of the apothecary. It shall be a holy anointing oil, and you shall anoint the tabernacle of the assembly therewith and the ark of the testimony and the table and all his vessels and the menorah and his vessels and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offering with all his vessels and the laver and his foot. You shall sanctify them that they may be most holy. Whatsoever touches them shall be holy or set apart. So we'll stop there for a second. So, interesting. So, I don't know if any of you have smelled some of these spices. Myrrh, cinnamon, sweet calamus. We'll talk about what sweet calamus is in a second. Cassia, right? These things smell amazing. Um, we have a sister that makes a compound close to it, but not the exact. Um, and it just... Oh, it smells fantastic. Um, Sister Amalia makes it uh, from Sparrow and Dove Apothecary. And Shemin Hamashiach, the anointing, the oil of anointing. And this stuff, it's got the uh, olive oil, of course. It's got um, cinnamon. It's got the cassia. I think it has the myrrh. And it has, um, I think, cedarwood and something else. So it's very similar, but not exact. But I'm here to tell you, I don't want to stop smelling it. The sense of smell is one of my favorites. I like to smell. I love the smells that Abba has in this world. Um, you know, I never really got into um, um, oils and things like that. But um, there's just something about the sense of smell. I want to read a couple of uh, facts about the smell. And so what I'm saying is this, this anointing oil was probably extremely wonderful to smell. Let's let's read a little bit about this. Some interesting facts about the sense of smell. So, you can a new note, you can smell as a as fresh as a daisy every month and your scent cells are renewed every 28 days, so every 4 weeks you get a new nose. Smell is the most sensitive of the senses. People rem can remember smells with 65% accuracy after a year, while visual recall is about 50% after three months. Research has shown that smell is the sense most linked to our emotional recollection. So when linked to a product that can help reap dividends, oh, we don't care about that. Um, so anyways, um, uh, Anyways, it, there's a lot of there's a lot of cool things here, um, a lot of really interesting things about smell, and uh, one thing that I hate most about getting sick or having a runny nose is when I, I guess not, it's not like this for everybody, but like when my nose is stopped up, I can't smell anything, of course, and I can't taste anything, and it's just like, ugh, how bland is life without smell, without taste, because taste is linked to smell, and um, I don't know, you know. Have we thanked him for the miracle of smell and the amazing, amazing smells that he's given us? If you haven't diffused essential oils, there's something about it. Um, something you should know about me. So, oh, where is it? So every, almost every time I am in the Word or doing poor portion or something I am always burning this frankincense and myrrh smell also now I'm diffusing frankincense and myrrh there's something about being in the word and having frankincense and myrrh uh, in the atmosphere there's just something about it I, I don't know there's just something about it that I thoroughly enjoy and it I don't know it just it just completes the experience of reading his word studying his word um getting these um, studies compiled. There's just something about frankincense and myrrh, some of these smells that he's ordained as set apart as holy. So just interesting stuff. Um, also, you know, one thing about this, there's a lot of debate right here. If you look at sweet calamus, calamus is actually poisonous. Um, calamus is, let's see, and ingested calamus may be toxic, right? Leading to its commercial ban in the United States. And it's a really cheap, this is a really cheap plant. Um, it's not highly valued. 
whereas every every other scent in here was highly valued and hard to acquire. So there's a lot of debate as to exactly what sweet calamus. Now, what I'm about to talk about, uh, it may scare you off, and if it does, I apologize. But one thing I like to do here is I like to talk about the things that really nobody wants to talk about because, you know, I'm not going to judge anyone else why they don't talk about certain things. But I feel called to talk about, well, really everything that we can here in the Word and, and to learn and to grow together. And what's interesting is when you look at this, Exodus 30, 23, and when you look at um, the what was translated as sweet calamus, the Hebrew is can it bosom? And a lot of people, some people have said, well, that's enough. That's enough for me. That is, you know, that's cannabis. It very well may be. I tend to think it was. Um, you know, cannabis is a highly valuable plant um, with a lot of uses. And some people, you know, some of you out there, especially your, your older generations that were raised in a society that demonized it, going all the way back to like reefer madness in the 20s where um, they demonized cannabis and you know, promoted their pharmaceuticals instead, just like they demonize uh, colloidal silver and really any um, holistic, uh, I don't know if holistic is the right word, I don't know if that's a good word or not, but any natural uh, remedy as opposed to, um, you know, pharmaceuticals, because really there's not a lot, there's not a lot of money in uh, natural remedies for them. The money is in their synthesized drugs and, and pharmaceuticals and things like that, which a lot of the things they, they do may originally derive as that, but they, they, they change the compounds, they uh, synthesize it. Um, it's just, it's all over the place. And so one thing I want to take a look at is, let's just, we have to, we have to see what the word says. Sirach 38, 4 through 10. Yahuwah created medicines from the earth and a sensible man will not despise them. People, uh, I'm not here to, to be, a, you know, promoting cannabis, you know, but I'm also here to say that we should also shouldn't demonize it because people call cannabis like the devil's lettuce. Um, you know, does does the devil have the ability to create plants in the earth? I'm here to say I don't think so. That's just where I'm at. I believe that Yahuwah made this plant, even the cannabis plant that people demonize and call the devil's lettuce. Yahuwah created medicines from the earth, and a sensible man will not despise them. Was not water made sweet with a tree in order that his power might be known? And he gave skill to men that he might be glorified in his marvelous works. By them he heals and takes away pain. The pharmacist, really, that's the modern translation, really, the, the um, apothecary, the person that makes oils and tinctures and stuff, makes them of a compound like we just read in Exodus 30. His works will never be finished, and from him health is upon the face of the earth. My son, when you are sick, do not be negligent, but pray to Yahuwah, and he will heal you. Give up your faults and direct your hands aright and cleanse your heart from all sin. So this is really, I mean, this is just... We see a couple things here. We see that Yah gives the herbs of the earth for healing, that he himself is the healer, that we pray to him, um, that he uses people to um, use the herbs of the earth to make compounds to help people. Um, and here, you know, when it comes to cannabis, um, you know, we think of cannabis and the first thought that comes to mind is someone just sitting around smoking weed, eating potato chips, playing video games, and wasting their life away. Um, that is a uh, total misuse of the plant, in my opinion. Just like wine wasn't made for you to go be a drunkard in, you know, um, acting a fool and being lascivious and, um, you know, other things that being a drunkard leads to. Um, you know, so just like wine can be abused, I think cannabis can be abused. But, you know, to demonize the plant and say that, you know, CBD is wrong or, or even THC oils or, or compounds is wrong. Um, I think we're really taking a stab at Genesis 1 where he said that um, he called all the green herbs, uh, herb-bearing seeds, he called them tov, he called them good. So there's always one of those scriptures that says, woe unto them that call good evil and evil good, right? So people that would demonize cannabis would be quick to, you know, um, be okay with pharmaceuticals, which I think are evil, right? Um, so we got to be very careful with these topics and... You know, I also, being in this walk for, for some time, I've had an opportunity to speak with a lot of people that cannabis was a medicine that Yah allowed them to use as 
well, like I said, medicine, helping them from depression, um, addictions, you know, to alcohol, to pharmaceuticals, whatever it may be. And <clears throat> I'm here as a witness that I use cannabis for some time. And, you know, it helped me become out of depression. I was at a point, a low point in my life, uh, you know, gosh, maybe 10 years ago, 10, nine, 10 years ago, where I was a low point in my life where I was thinking of suicide. And I was addicted to alcohol and drugs and um, I say drugs like pills, like pharmaceutical pills and things like that. And with my my walk back to him, my prayers, seeking him, repentance, and what I do believe is him allowing me to use cannabis allowed me to step away from all those things and to be healed today. I no longer use cannabis, um, but I'm also not here not to, to demonize it. You know, um, again, I think our mind goes straight to the extreme of somebody being like, you know, just sitting around smoking, smoking cannabis all day and just wasting their life away. That's certainly not what it was used for. Like I said, just like that's not what wine was used for. But anyways, I, I don't want to keep going and going on this topic. But like I said, I feel led to talk about the topics that really nobody else wants to touch for whatever reasons. I'm not here to judge anybody, but um I feel like Yas put me in a position to be able to talk about these things uh, because of where I've been and and how uh, far along he's allowed me to come. Um, I don't know. I just want to share that with you. So like I said, when I do these studies, um, I'm not some, you know, I'm not afraid to, to share um, things like this. And so can we conclude that cannabis was in the holy anointing, holy anointing oil? No. If you ask me my opinion, was it? I think so. Um, so, yeah. Um, we'll just leave it at that. So I hope I didn't scare you off um, because if you have a strong um, opposition to cannabis, um, I hope I don't scare you off. Um, I hope we can still be brothers and sisters. But like I said, I just feel called to to share these things. So let's keep, let's move on. Uh, we talked about all this. Okay, and so verse 30, And you shall anoint Aharon and his sons and consecrate them, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And you shall speak unto the children of Yashrael, saying, This shall be a holy anointing oil unto me throughout your generations. Upon man, upon man's flesh shall it not be poured, neither shall you make any other like it after the composition of it. It is holy, and it shall be holy unto you. Whatsoever compounds any like it, or whatsoever whosoever puts any of it upon a stranger, even he shall be cut off from his people. So, you know, that's that bears in that that, you know, bears the question, you know, could we have a compound like this today? You know, are we, you know, sons of Aaron, Levites, you know, who knows? But, you know, are we have we been anointed into the priesthood through Messiah Yahusha into a new priesthood? Yeah. Is this allowed? Well, maybe, maybe not. It's just something to consider, something to think about. All right, uh, verse 34. And Yahweh said unto Moshe, Take unto you sweet spices, stacte, onica, galbanum, these sweet spices with pure frankincense, of each shall there be a like weight. And you shall make it a perfume, a confection after the art of the apothecary, tempered together, pure and holy. And this has got to be amazing. Frankincense is literally one of my favorite. And ye shall beat some of it very small, and put it before the testimony of the tabernacle of the assembly, where I will meet with you, and it shall be unto you most holy. And as for the perfume which you shall make, you shall not make it to yourselves according to the composition thereof. It shall be unto you holy for Yahuwah. Whosoever shall make like unto that to smell thereto shall even be cut off from his people. So let's um, let's let's consider this. So what the really the thing to glean from here is mixing the holy with the profane. You know we're a set apart people. We are not to mix our service with the service of the world and that's why we've stepped away from and we'll talk more about this when we get to the golden calf here in a little bit but that's why we have decided to step away from christmas and easter and uh, sunday worship and all these other things that were ordained by men and not by yah so attempting to serve him in the ways of the world would be mixing the set apart with whole with the profane because we are supposed to be set apart we're supposed to be holy these incense, these fragrances are supposed to be holy, right? Somewhere, um, Paul says, uh, sweet-smelling 
fragrance. Um, where was it? Oh, I'll probably waste your time searching for it. But Paul says that we are supposed to be like a sweet-smelling fragrance before him. When, of course, we have our faith and obedience, those kind of things. So we, and when our prayers are supposed to be like an ascending smoke offering to him, or like incense before him. So we, as that incense or that fragrance before him, should not be mixing the holy with the profane. And we know that Aaron's sons were to be set apart as holy and not be like the common. So we are supposed to be set apart people and not like the common people out there. Not setting ourselves above anybody or like we're better than everybody, but we're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be peculiar. And we're not supposed to mix those two together. Okay, let's, uh, let's go to chapter 31. All right, let's read uh, Exodus 31, 1 through 10 and talk about it. We're talking about Oholiab and Bezael. Beza, Yahweh spoke to Moshe saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Urai, the son of Horai, the son of the tribe of Yahuda. And I have filled him with the Ruach Elohim in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to devise cunning works, to work in gold and silver and in brass and in cutting of stones to set them and in carving of timber to work all manner of workmanship. And I, behold, I have given with him Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, the tribe of Dan, and in the hearts of all that are wise-hearted I have poured, put wisdom that they may make all that I have commanded you. The tabernacle of the assembly, the ark of the testimony, the mercy seat that is thereupon, and all the furniture of the tabernacle, and the table of his furniture, and the pure menorah with all his furniture, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering with all his furniture, and the laver of his foot, and the cloths of service, and the holy garments for Aharon the priest, and the garments for his sons to minister in the priest's office, and the anointing oil and the sweet incense for the holy place, according to all that I have commanded, shall you do. So, like we're learning here on the Torah, there's almost everything is like a shadow of Messiah, right? Like, like Paul says, these are a shadow of things to come. Doesn't mean like a shadow; it's bad and so stop doing it, right? But it's it's just a picture, or, or just like the Passover lamb was a shadow of Messiah, our perfect Passover lamb for us. So also, also this as well, a holy Yab and Bezalel. I'll show you. <clears throat> So we're, he, we're just talking about how he's making all the cunning works in gold, silver, brass, the stones, the timber, all manner of workmanship, right? 2 Timothy 2.20 In a great house, there is not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and earthenware, and some for noble use, some for ignoble. If anyone purifies himself from what is ignoble for, or iniquity, right? Or, um, um, yeah, ignoble, I guess is a good word. Then he will be a vessel for noble use, consecrated and useful to the master's house, ready for any good work. So let me ask you a question. So just as Bezalel was filled with the Ruach of Elohim, wisdom and understanding and knowledge, right? Let me ask you a question. Was Messiah, is Messiah currently building his father's house? Because we read earlier, there were all to be stones of that house. Is he not forming us? Is he not forming us as stones? Carving us? Perfecting us? Trimming off the edges so that we fit tightly together? As Isaiah 11, 1 through 3, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. This is Messiah. And the spirit of Yahweh shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might and the spirit of knowledge and the fear of Yahuwah. So, Bezalel was given the Ruach of Elohim of wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. These are the seven spirits that we see in Revelation. Well, Bezalel was given four of those. Messiah also has the spirit of Yahuwah, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, and the spirit of knowledge. Plus he had three more, of course. But, so just as Bezalel was, was charged and given these spirits to build the tabernacle, to build the house, Messiah was given all seven spirits to build his father's house. John 14, 2-6, In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I, um, if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And when I go and prepare a place for you, right, build his house, I will come again and take you to myself, where 
I am, you may be also. So when he comes again, he's coming with his father's house. And you know the way where I'm going, Thomas said unto him, Master, we do not know the way where you're going. How can we know the way? Yahushua said to him, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And we know that he is the Torah. But the point is, is that Messiah is the one preparing that place, which is his Father's house. New Jerusalem. Right? So just as Aholiab and Bezalel were building this house and giving those spirits, Yahushua is also doing the same. To Ezra 1335, but he will stand on top of Mount Zion, and Zion will come and be made manifest to all people, prepared and built, as you saw the mountain carved without hands, right? Because it's not built with human hands, it's built with Messiah's hands. And he, my son, will reprove the assembled nations for their ungodliness. This was symbolized by the storm, and will reproach them to their face with their evil thoughts and the torments with which they are to be tortured with which were symbolized by the flames and will be destroy them without effort by the Torah, which was symbolized by the fire. I mean, even more interesting, because <laughs> there's no, there's no coincidences. Bezalel's name means in the shadow of Yahuwah, the shadow of Elohim. And we were saying that these things are a shadow of him. So Oholiab and Bezalel are literally a shadow of Messiah to come to build his father's house. Aholiab's name is guess what his guess, guess what Aholiab's name is my father's tent ah. <laughs> oh man his word is awesome all right let's talk about the Shabbat and Yahweh spoke unto Moshe saying speak also unto the children of Yashrael saying truly my Shabbatot my Sabbaths you shall guard. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations forever. Forever. That you may know that I am Yahweh Mikodishkim, who sanctifies you. You shall guard the Shabbat therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defiles it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever does any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Shabbat of rest, holy to Yahuwah. Whosoever does any work in the Shabbat, he shall be surely put to death. Be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Yisrael shall guard the Shabbat to keep the Shabbat throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. So people, people will like you know will quote stuff like this. Be like, ah, you're saying you never defiled the Sabbath. See, you broke it, so it's it. It's over. Well, the good news is praise Yah for His mercy uh, with us, because we've all broken the Shabbat. But now that we've learned about the Shabbat, right, we're repenting of our old ways and we're seeking to do it right now with all of our heart. To keep the Shabbat throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Yashrael forever. For in six days Yahuwah made the heavens and the earth and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Why? Why is it a sign between us and him? It's literally the first two pages of our first page or two pages of our Bible that he made the heavens and the earth in six days and on the seventh he rested. So we're either going to follow his example or we're going to follow the example of the Roman Catholic Church that said, no, 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 no. First day of the week. Because we're going to change the word. We're going we're to mistranslate uh, mia, mia, ton, mia Sabbaton in Greek and we're going to change that from Sabbath to first day of the week. The venerable day of the sun. The, their decree. Which they say is their mark. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, you know, <clears throat> there's been people that have vehemently preached Torah and are kind of starting to back off and uh, back off of the importance. And I'm here to tell you, the Shabbat, it's so important. You know, the Shabbat is the most spoken commandment in all of Scripture. Someone once asked me, well, well, someone recently asked me, well, Adam, how much Torah do we have to keep to get in? It's a good question. Good question. It got me thinking. What's the difference? Well, in my opinion, it's what he puts on upon us as a sign. Let's read about that real quick. 
Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our Elohim is one. And you shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. And you shall teach them diligently unto your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them upon the, the post of your house and on your gates. So we know that there's no coincidences that in Revelation 13, when it talks about the mark of the beast, that it's on the hand and the forehead, that's a sign. Well, I believe it's a spiritual mark. I believe it has to do with our faith and obedience and who is that obedience is to. So we're either going to obey Yahweh's mark that we acknowledge that he's the creator of heaven and earth and that we're going to follow him in his decree or we're going to follow him in man-made traditions and ways. So Deuteronomy 6 says basically all his commandments are as a sign. Ezekiel 9, 4 through 5, And Yahweh said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that are done in the midst thereof. Have you thought about what's done in the world lately? And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let, your not, let, let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. And this is not just about you know all the crazy stuff done in the world. you know. But what about all the Torahlessness in the world? Right? Those people are marked. Right? Mark, on, mark them on the foreheads. Exodus 13, 8 through 9. And you shall show your son in that day, saying, This is done because of that which Yahweh did unto me when I came forth out of Egypt. This is the Pesach and Unleavened Bread festival. And when we do it, it shall be for a sign upon you on your hand and a memorial between your eyes, hand and forehead, that Yahweh's Torah may be in your mouth. So his feast days are a sign. Exodus 12, 13, and the blood shall be to you for a token. This is the same Hebrew word for sign, for o, for, for mark. So the blood, of, the blood of the lamb is to be a mark. We know the firstborn also in Exodus 13 is a mark. Revelation 13, 16 through 17, he causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in the right hand or in their foreheads and that no man might buy or sell it save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name no coincidences brothers and sisters this is, has everything to do with obedience and i think it's in um i think it's also in romans 6 oops romans 6 no who you obey is your master what is that Oh, it was Romans 6. Yeah. Know ye not to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey? His servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness? But thank, but, but Elohim be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that from the doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Right? So who we obey is our master. So when we do the Shabbat, this is something we do every single week. When we do the Shabbat, we acknowledge that he made the earth in six days and rested on the seventh, and we're going to do like him. We're going to walk as he walked. We're going to do like him. We said all things were all things were made through Messiah, right? And we're supposed to walk like he walked. We're supposed to do as he do, do as he did. Sorry, I'm not an English major. <laughs> In any case, you get, you get what I'm saying. What do I have here? I don't even remember this. What do I have this here? Oh, yeah, sign. It is a sign between me and you. Hebrew word, ot. A sign, signal, distinguishing mark. All right, here it is. The golden calf. Oh, we didn't read verse 18. And he gave unto Moshe, which he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two sapphires of testimony, sapphire stones written with the finger of Elohim. When you think about written with the finger of Elohim, does a certain passage in the New Testament come to mind? For me, it reminds me of when the Pharisees were talking to Yahushua about the woman who was caught in adultery, and they were trying to trip Messiah up because... Both the man and the woman were not taken uh, to be judged. It was just the woman. So they were going to try to tr 
trick Messiah into disobeying Torah, but he's like, okay, I'm the Torah, so you can't trick me. So they're talking to him, and he's just like writing in, in the dust, right? What's he writing? Maybe he's writing the Torah. Maybe he's writing that Torah commandment that both should be brought out. I don't know. But I believe that it was Messiah on Mount Sinai that did this, right? He wrote with his finger, so... I don't know. Just reminds me of that. So, uh, actually, before we go to 32, let's look at a couple passages in the Targums. Uh, 31. Oops, 31, 13. Oh, that's 30. 31, 13. Also speak with your sons of Yashrael, saying, You shall keep the day of my Shabbats indeed, for it is a sign between my word and you, that you may know that I am Yahweh who sanctifies you. If there's any ever like any like confusion like oh is it Messiah speaking is it Yahweh speaking, well remember Messiah himself said that his jo- his doctrine wasn't even his own, it was the Father's that gave it to him, so even when he speaks it's literally the Father speaking right, not that he's literally the Father because he's the Son the, the, the scriptures clearly state that he's the Son, but if the Son declare who is the express image of him which we'll read here in a little bit when he when he speaks he's speaking on you know for Yahuwah. so it's literally you know it's Yahuwah speaking. So I said 13, 17, and 18. Between my word and the sons of Yashrael, it is a sign forever. For in six days Yahuwah created and perfected the heavens and the earth, and the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Let's go to 32. The gold calf. This is the big one. Hang on. I need a little refreshment refreshment from the copper cup before I talk about the golden calf. Apparently this is good for you to drink water from a copper vessel. Josh says you can't have enough copper. All right. Golden calf. Let's read uh, verses one through six. <clears throat> and when the people saw that Moshe delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aharon and said unto him, Up! Make us Elohim, which shall go before us. As for this Moshe, the man that brought us up out of the land of Mitzrayim, we know not what will become of him. And Aharon said unto them, Break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your women, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. The people broke off the golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them unto El Aharon. And he received them at their hand, and fashioned it with a graving tool, after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be your Elohim, O Yisrael, which brought you up out of the land of Mitzrayim. And then when Aharon saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aharon made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to Yahuwah. And they rose up early in the morning and offered up offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. That doesn't sound good, right? So, interesting. Let's read the Targums now, 1 through 6. Here's an interesting read. But the people saw that Moshe delayed to come down from the mount, and the people gathered together unto Aharon. And when they saw that the time he had appointed to them had passed, and that Satana had come, and caused them to err, and perverted their hearts with pride, and they said to him, Arise, make us Elohim that shall go before us. As for this Moshe, the man whom brought us up by the land of Mitzrayim, he may have been consumed in the mountain by the fire which the flames from before Yahuwah, and we know not what has befallen him, befallen him in his end. And Aharon said to them, Deliver the golden earrings, golden rings that are in your ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. And their wives denied themselves to give their ornaments to their husbands, and all the people at once delivered up the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aharon. And he took them from their hands and bound them in a wrapper and wrought it with a tool, having made a molten calf. And he said, These, Yashrael, are your Elohim, which brought you forth from the land of Mitzrayim. For Aharon had seen her slain before him and was afraid, and he built an altar before him. And Aharon cried with a doleful voice and said, Let there be a feast before Yahuwah tomorrow of the sacrifice of the slain of these adversaries who have denied their Yahuwah and have changed the glory of the presence of Yahuwah for this calf. So it's interesting here. I've always wondered you know, how Aharon was going to do this. I guess you know, if, if her was slain, as this text uh, says, then you know, I guess it makes a little more sense. And on the day following, it's still not good. And then I'm not judging Aharon because pff, I lived a life of idolatry and I'm no one to judge Aharon, the great Aharon. But, you know, it makes a little more sense at least of why, you know, it seemed like he didn't put up a fight. And then when you read the, the Masoretic text, which we read earlier, he seems like, he's like, okay. But here it's just like, you know, he was probably forced at sword point. 
And on the day following, they arose and sacrificed burnt offerings, and the people sat around to eat and drink and rose up to disport themselves with strange service. So going back here, it is interesting <clears throat> that specifically, because when, when the children of Israel came out, they were given lots of jewels and gold and silver and all kinds of things. But why specifically were their earrings? I just have a theory, just some something to consider. Uh-oh. The internet is doing its internet thing again. Boy, it's camper life. It's tough sometimes. I'm, I'm working off of a hot spot that doesn't like to work all the time. Give me just a second here. Uh, let's see here. It says I'm connected. Here it is. Exodus 19, now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and if we want to obey his voice, we have to hear it, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Yisrael. John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 4, I charge thee therefore before Elohim and Yahuwah, uh, the Adonai, Yahusha HaMashiach, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and at his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts they shall heap themselves teachers, having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. And you ask you a question, isn't that really what happened, uh, you know, without really the explanation in Exodus 32 with the golden calf? It, don't you think that's what happened? Don't you think there were some people that stood up and had strange doctrine and people were itching of ears because they didn't thirst after his word? They didn't thirst after obedience to the Torah that they heaped up from themselves teachers and had itching ears for strange doctrine. And is that happening today? Well, yeah. Not even just in, in uh, modern-day mainstream Christianity, which doesn't obey the truth in the Torah. Of course, you know, they have itching ears. I mean, if you think about it, it's, it's a sad cycle. People go once a week to pay their tithes, to be spoken a sermon about how, really, at the end of the day, even though if it's not, you know, the message each week, but that, you know, Jesus freed them from the law. They don't have to do it because it's too hard. Nobody can do it. And we're sinners, and, you know, to be comfortable with that, right? Like the, like the verse says, my, my people, my, you know, the, the priests prophesy their own hearts, and my people love to have it so. It, I'm paraphrasing. It's not uh, verbatim, but and the people love to have it so. So the people of the earth have itchy ears. People in Christianity have itchy ears. But even people that come to this Torah walk, I've noticed. Because what happens is, when people come to the Torah and they're not satisfied with it, their ears are itching for, they, their ears become itching for the next big thing because they came to Torah because it was, you know, for a lot of people in the truth or communities, right? It was biblical cosmology. It was the signs in the heavens. It was like, uh, you know, the, the apocryphal books, the Dead Sea Scroll books, Enoch and everything led us to Torah. And Torah was like the next big thing. You know, you look at like really years 2015 through now. I mean, that Torah has been a, a big thing for people that really search truth. But some people have itching ears that they came to this and they weren't satisfied with it. And they, their ears were itchy for the next big thing. And they fell away because they weren't satisfied with the Torah. And Messiah Yahushua says, Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. So people that don't really hunger and thirst after righteousness won't be filled, and they will heap up to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. So what happened here with the golden calf? They had itching ears. They heaped for themselves teachers. And they turned away from the truth, right? They turned away from the truth and turned into fables, which is what this golden calf, it came from Egypt, right? That's what they knew. Egypt is filled with fables, things that are not sound doctrine and not the truth. They worship cows and sheep and birds and other four-footed beasts and creeping things and all kinds of garbage. And Israel turned to that. And what's, what's terrible is, you know, <clears throat> they're like, tomorrow's a feast to Yahuwah. 
So like, hey, you know, let's celebrate him our way. Let's celebrate him the way we want to celebrate him. And think about that. The people were not patient. They did not endure. They just quickly went back to their old ways. Like a dog that returns back to its vomit. The old proverb that Peter talks about in Second Peter 2 at the end. They're like a, a, a pig that was washed and went right back to jumping in the in the mud. Like a dog that eats its own vomit back up. That's what these people did. And that's what some people do coming to the Torah. Right? It's just like the, the parable of the seeds. This is the interpretation of it. Matthew 13, 19 through 23. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it not, then comes the wicked one and catches away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. Right? He was never really, never really firmly founded in it. But he that received seed into stony places, the same as he that hears the word and anon with joy receives it. With joy, right? Yet he has no root himself, but endures for a while. But when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also that received among the thorns is he that hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. But he that receives the seed into the good ground is he that hears the word and understands it, which also bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty and some thirty. So of course we want to be this ground. So we can't be hasty like these people were so quickly to, to, to move on and, and, and go back to their old ways. We can't be this way. We can't follow their example. First Corinthians 10 says that all these things, right? Neither be idolaters if some of them were. First Corinthians 10, I don't think I had this in the study, but I should have. Um, <clears throat> Neither be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written that people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And that's really what Christmas and Easter and all these false ways, it's idolatry. Especially Christmas is idolatry, right? And that's why we have to flee these things. We have to flee them like they're an unclean thing. Oops, I wasn't done with this. There's more. But wait, there's more. First John 4, there's really like two verses I want to read from this, but this chapter is so good. I'm going to read the whole thing. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of Elohim, because many false prophets are gone out into the world just like there's many false teachers now in the world now. Hereby know you the spirit of Elohim. Every spirit that confesses that Yahushua HaMashiach is come in the flesh is of Elohim. And every spirit that confesses not that Yahushua is come in the flesh is not of Elohim. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you heard that it should come, even now already is it in the world. You are of Elohim, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. When I first started this channel, this was like the opening verse for every study I did. They are of the world, therefore they speak of the world, and the world hears them. Itching ears. We are of Elohim. He that knows Elohim hears us. He that is not of Elohim hears us not. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for the love is of Elohim. And everyone that loves is born of Elohim and knows Elohim. He that loves not knows not Elohim, for Elohim is love. And this was manifested, the love of, of Elohim towards us, because that Elohim sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Right? And this has been a big debate lately. Um, a lot of people have come against me and have um, condemned me because I don't believe that Yahusha is also the father. I believe the text clearly says, you know, and I'm not condemning anybody else because I can understand how people would think that. But the text clearly says that Elohim sent his only begotten son. Why wouldn't he? Why didn't it say that Elohim sent himself into the world, right? Why didn't it say the Father sent himself? And then I'm not mocking anybody, but I'm just saying when we come across scriptures like this, it's like, what do I do with this? Here in his love, that not, that, not that we loved Elohim, but that he loved us and then sent his son to the, be the perpetuation for our sins. Why didn't it say that he sent himself? Beloved, if Elohim so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen Elohim at any time. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. If we love one another, Elohim dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that the Spirit dwells in him and he in us, because he has given us, given us of his Spirit. And we have seen and do testify, now listen closely, that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. What do you do with that? So if you currently believe that the Messiah was also the Father, hopefully you can at least understand why I believe that the Father sent the Son. 
And this is talking about it. This is how we know, right? Hereby we know that we dwell in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit and we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Yahusha is the Son of Elohim, Elohim dwells in him and he in Elohim. And we have known <clears throat> and we have known and believed that the love of Elohim has to us. Elohim is love, and he that dwells in love dwells in Elohim, and Elohim in him. And herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. Um <clears throat> There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear has torment, and he that fears is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love Elohim, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he that loves not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love Elohim who he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves Elohim loves his brother also. All right. So, one thing about the golden calf that's inter interesting <clears throat> the difference between serving Yah and serving him and serving the golden calf is night and day. Serving the calf is like, it's like serving the flesh. It's easier. At first it's easier, but of course the toll it takes on you is harder. But think about this, because a calf can be served when you want, where you want, and how you want. Yahuwah, serving Yahuwah, it takes a little challenge of the flesh because you serve him where he wants, how he wants, and when he wants. Think about that for a second. That's the difference between serving Yah and serving the golden calf. And unfortunately, Christianity is a modern-day golden calf. That's right. I said it. Exodus 32, 7. And Yahweh said unto Moshe, Go, get you down, for your people, which you brought out of the land of Mitzrayim, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be your Elohim, O Yashorel, which brought you up out of the land of Mitzrayim. And Yahweh said unto Moshe, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Therefore, let them be alone. That, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of you a great nation. So it's interesting. Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if it's humor or not, and I can't even imagine to speak for Yahuwah. But, you know, it's like, you know, when my kids do something wrong or, or bad or whatever, you know, kind of in a joking way, I'll be like, Hey, you know, your daughter is doing such and such, you know, like, it's like, just joking. Like all of a sudden, you know, it's not my daughter. It's your daughter. Like, Hey, your daughter or your son is like acting, acting crazy. You know, when I, when I would speak to, um, well, not my ex-wife, but any case, maybe that's <laughs> say, maybe that's why she, you know. what's interesting here is so so much so often throughout the Torah throughout the Torah Elohim like my people my people but like when they go and act crazy like this you now all of a sudden you know, I was like hey Moses your people right so I, I can't presume that there's humor in here this is the Torah but it's just interesting interesting but here verse 10 here is a interesting challenge and test for Moshe I think about this for a second I never thought about this until this year now therefore let me alone that I, my wrath may wax hot against them and that I may consume them and I will make of you a great nation think about that for a second if Moshe was prideful which he's not of course or selfish uh, or greedy of gain or whatever Yahuwah himself or Yahusha at this point gave Moshe the ability to be the new Abraham think about that for a second if he killed everybody, he would be the new, the new lineage would come from him. Think about this. Let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them and that I may consume them and I will make of you a great nation. That's the same promise he gave to Abraham. So this, so, you know, Yahuwah obviously picked Moshe for a reason because he knew Moshe wouldn't give in and be like, yeah, you know what? You know what, Elohim? You know what, Yahuwah? You know what, Yahusha? Let's do this. Me and you. These people are ridiculous. Right? They always complain. They want to stone me for everything. 
Let's do it. Let's start a new people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know what? Let's do it. Me and you. Of course, that's not what Moshe did, right? And Moshe besought El Yahuwah Elohinu and said, Yahuwah, why does your wax, your wrath wax hot against your people, which you have brought forth out of the land of Mitzrayim with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore, why should the Mitzrayim speak and say, for mischief did he bring them out, to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and repent of this evil against your people. Remember Abraham, right? So he, he could have been tempted to being the new Abraham. But he's like, come on. He's quoting scripture. Remember Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, or Yisrael, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. And all this land have I spoken, will I give to your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. Verse 14, And Yahweh repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. So we see a couple things here. Number one, Yahweh can be reasoned with. Even if he has a decree... You know, if you come before him, as the book of Hebrews says, come boldly before the throne by the blood of Messiah, you come before him, giving him reverence and honor, reverence to his name, putting scripture and evidence before him and ask for a, a righteous judgment. Could he change his mind? Sure. Can he deliver you? Absolutely. We see this time and time again throughout the, the scriptures. And that's what Moshe did. He basically quoted scripture. Don't you remember? And he's even appealing to Yahweh's own name. He's like, what? he cares for Yah's name. He's like, what are other people going to say about you if you do this? How much even more so for ourselves? Is this an example for ourselves? If we tell people that we're followers of Yah and keepers of his Torah and we're acting a fool, what are other people, people going to say about Torah keepers? Well, pff, that's definitely not the way. Right? Especially when we bicker amongst each other. Especially those of you that are still like on Facebook and going back and forth. And no, the calendar is this. No, the, you're you are lost. And blah, blah, blah. no, the pronunciation is this. You are totally lost. You know, blah, blah, blah. it's like come on. Like who's gonna be like? Yeah, those guys have the truth. I want some of that. Nobody. You're profaning his name. Profaning his name. What are the other nations gonna think of his name? With your doings, with your behavior, with your actions. And Moshe was like, he, he's cared for. He's like, what are people going to think of your name? If you do this, remember what you said to Abraham. And Yahweh was like, okay. He can be reasoned with. Just like uh, Abraham with Sodom and Gomorrah. He's like, you're going to kill everybody? What if there's 50, 40, 30, 20, 10 righteous in there? He was like, okay. All right. That's why he picks people like this to petition on behalf of the weak, petition on behalf of the innocent, which in this case they weren't innocent. But he still petitioned for them. He could have been like, you're right. These people are all idolaters. Get rid of them all. Me and you. Me and you, yeah. We'll be buddies. We'll start this. We'll start over. But he didn't. And that's why he picked Moshe. Right? So how quick are we for others to be in a judgment, even if they're wrong? Even if they wrong us, how quick are we? You'd be like, oh yeah. Pfft. Hope you get yours. Or how about petitioning and praying for them? Like Moshe did. Just something to consider. Verse 15. And Moshe turned and went down from the mount, and the two sapphires of the testimony were in his hand. The sapphires were written on both on both of their sides, on the one side and the other were they written. And the sapphires were the work of Elohim, and the writing was the writing of Elohim graven upon sapphires. And when Yahusha heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moshe, There is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry, being overcome, but the noise of them that, that sing do I hear. And it came to pass as soon as he came nigh into the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing and Moshe's anger waxed hot and he cast the sapphires out of his hands and broke them beneath the mouth. Sapphire is strong. Moshe with, with his anger was like, Ur. and he took the calf which they had made and burnt it in the fire and ground it to powder and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Yashel drink it. Double take, right? We find this later on. Um, Hezekiah... Was it Hezekiah or Josiah? I think it was Hezekiah. Did something similar. Um, any case, or maybe it was Josiah. But either way, like we should be like a King Josiah generation, breaking down these altars and these, uh, of course, spiritually. You know, we're supposed to go around and like do that. We're we're like Daniel in Babylon. He didn't go around and destroying every single witch's covenant and, and you know 
idols of Bell and Nebo and whoever. But in us, in our lives, in our hearts, tearing down the idols and the idolatry that we once participated in, getting rid of it, and coming back to his service with all of our heart. Let's be the King Josiah generation that that didn't know about the Torah, but then the Torah gets read to him. He's like, <gasps> weeping. And yeah, I was like, yeah, I see you. I see you. And Moshe said unto Elahron, What did this people uh, do unto you that you have brought so great a sin upon them? And Elahron said, Let not your anger of my master wax hot. You know the people that they are set on mischief. For they said unto me, Make us Elohim which shall go before us. As for this Moshe, the man that brought us up out of the land of Mitzrayim, we know not what has become of him. Right? They're so quick to turn. They're so quick to hear another's voice. And I said unto them, Whosoever has any gold, let them break it off. And so they gave it to me. And then I cast into the fire, and there came out this calf, right? It's almost, it's like, it's it almost, this, this text almost positions it like, he's like, I don't know, I just threw this gold in there, and this calf came jumping out. I don't know. I think the Targums is a little clearer. Uh, what is that? 32, 24. Uh, and I said unto them, whoever has this gold, let him deliver it and give it to me. And I cast into the fire and Satana entered into it. And there came out of it the, mul- the similitude of this calf. And when Moshe saw that the people were naked, for Aharon had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies, um, the Targums has something else to say about this as well. It's kind of interesting. Then Moshe stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on Yahweh's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus says Yahweh of Yashrael, Put every man's sword by his side and go in and out from his gate to gate through the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moshe and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. It's interesting. The day of, this is, most people do know that this time here was a time of Shavuot. Um, it's interesting that thousands of years later in Shavuot with the giving of the Ruach that 3,000 souls were saved. For Moshe had said, Consecrate yourselves today to Yahweh, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moshe said unto the people, You have sinned a great sin, and now I'll go up unto El Yahuwah. Perchance I shall make an atonement for your sin. It's interesting, these Levites going out and killing these 3,000 people. This is where we see this in Deuteronomy 33. Now the tribe tribe of Levi, he said, Let thy Thummim and thy Urim be with thy Holy One, whom you did prove at Masa, and with whom you did strive at the waters of Meribah, who said unto his father and to his mother, I have not seen him, neither did he acknowledge his brethren, nor knew his own children, for they have observed thy word and kept thy covenant. And that's what this is actually talking about, that they didn't know, uh, they didn't, it didn't matter if it was mother or father or son or brother, whoever was guilty in the transgression of the um, golden calf, they slew them without, without, you know, hesitation. They put Yah first before their own family. They shall teach Jacob thy judgments and Israel thy law. They shall put incense before you and whole burnt sacrifice upon your altar. Bless Yahweh his substance and accept the work of his hands. Smite through the loins of them that rise against him and of them that hate him that they rise not again. But it's interesting here um, that they cared more for uh, Yah than anything else. Matthew 10, 32 through 38. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him also will I deny before my Father which is in heaven. Think not that I have come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Now he's not talking about brotherly division here, but he's talking about division between truth and falsehood. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against his mother or her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that takes on his cross and follows after me is not worthy of me. So just as the Levites esteemed Yahuwah, Yahusha, over his own family, so those in under the, the priesthood of Messiah Yahusha also are the same way that the Levites. Not that we're supposed to slay our mother and father, and son, that's not what it's talking about. But we can't let our love for our mother or our father or our son or our daughter or wife or anybody come in between serving our Yahuwah to serving him in spirit and truth. That's what comes first. And that's very opposite to what the world teaches you, right? Even modern day Christianity uh, says that your family comes first. Well, 
outside of after Yahuwah and his ways, I agree with you, it comes first for anything. But when it comes to the service of Yahuwah, that comes first. That's how I see it. That's how I understand it. 31. And Moshe returned unto El Yahuwah and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them an Elohai of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray you, out of the sephir which you have written. And Yahuwah said unto Moshe, Whoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my sephir. So it's interesting that, you know, Yahusha, even when he was crucified, he on the cross, what did he say? He's cursed you all, you sinners, for crucifying me. No. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Meek, humble, petitioning for the people. That's how, yeah, that's how Moses worked. That's how Yahusha worked. That's how we should work. Even if someone sins against you, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Think about it. Try it. Try it on for size. It may change your life. Um, and think about this. Um, I read it earlier. Let's see, 33. Yahweh said to Moshe, Whoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my suffer. Revelation 3, 5. He that overcomes, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out of his name out of the book of life, but I'll confess his name before my father and before his angels. And we read earlier in Matthew, what was it? Matthew 10. He that denies me before men, I will deny him. All right, whoever denies me before men, him also will I deny before my father. There's an interesting um, study we did maybe a year ago, I think based off of this Torah portion. Um, are you denying Messiah unknowingly? Right? And when we deny Messiah, I think it goes a lot deeper than, you know, is, you know, is is Messiah is Yahusha your 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 Messiah at gunpoint? And if you if you say yes, you're gonna die. Uh, I think it's a lot deeper than that. Um, I think that's what a lot of us envision. A lot of us envision like being at gunpoint or or, or faced at the guillotine. We like deny him, or you're gonna you know you're gonna die at this guillotine, or you're gonna, you're gonna die at um, um, you know, die at the, the the hand of this um, whatever. And a lot of us probably envision that, and that may be that may uh, be what he's talking about. But I think it's a lot deeper spiritually than that because we know that Messiah is the Word. He's the Torah. So what happens if we're denying the Torah? Aren't we denying Him? And this is a short study, 16 minutes. It's called, Are You Denying Messiah Unknowingly uh, Before Men? Um, and it also has a uh, transcript if you just want to read about it here. So if you want to search that out, search it out. But we did a little study on what it really means to deny Him. I think it goes a lot deeper than just denying that He is Messiah. All right. Therefore, now go, verse 34, Therefore now go and lead this people unto the place of which I have spoken unto you. Behold, my angel shall go before you, and nevertheless in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And Yahweh plagued the people because they made the calf which Aharon made. And we read we read this a couple times over the last uh, couple weeks, uh, that this, this angel, this messenger, uh, this Malak, um, is Messiah Yahusha. Jude confirms that Messiah is that messenger. Um, Exodus 33. Actually, yeah. Oh, here, I just want to read this. And Moshe saw that the people were naked. This is the Targums. For they had been stripped by the hand of Aharon of the set-apart crown, which was on the their head. This is probably like a spiritual crown. Inscribed and beautiful with the great and glorious name, and that their evil report would go forth, forth among the nations. That they would get them an evil name unto their generations. So, interesting. And then... Um, Let's see. Yeah, but go now. This is 34. Go now, lead the people of the place which I have told you. Behold, my messenger shall proceed before you. But on the day of my visitation, I will visit them upon their sin. And the word of Yahuwah plagued the people because they had bowed, bowed themselves to the calf that Aharon made. All right, chapter 33. Um, and Yahuwah said unto Moshe, Depart and go up hence, you and the people which you have brought up out of the land of Mitzrayim, unto the land which I swore unto Abraham, to Yitzchak, unto Jacob, saying, Unto your seed will I give it. And I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, and the Amorites, and the Hittites, and the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of you, for you are a stiff-necked stiff people, lest I consume you in the way. 
And when the people heard the evil report, they mourned, and no man did put on his ornaments. For Yahweh said unto Moshe, Say unto the children of Yashrael, You are a stiff-necked people. I will come up into the midst of you in a moment and consume you. Therefore now put off your ornaments from you, that I may know what to do unto you. And the children of Yashrael stripped themselves of their ornaments by the mount of Horeb. Kind of interesting. Um, when we think about the jewels, we talked about the stones on the breastplate last week um, on the, the high priest and the symbol of them being of the tribes of Israel. And it's just, you know, and how they're near and dear to his heart. And it's interesting here now when they do this, he's like, strip off those jewels from you. You don't deserve them right now, you know. All right, let's go to, let's keep reading. Okay, verse 7. And Moshe took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, far off from the camp, and called the tabernacle the assembly. Called it the tabernacle the assembly. It came to pass that everyone which sought Yahuwah went out into the tabernacle of the assembly, which was without the camp. And it came to pass when Moshe went out into the tabernacle that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moshe until he was gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass, as Moshe entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and Yahuwah talked with Moshe. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar at the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose up and worshipped every man at his tent door. And Yahuwah spoke unto Moshe face to face, as a man speaks unto his friend, and he turned again into the camp. But his servant Yahusha, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. So, uh, let's read verse 9 of the Targums. It says, And it came to pass when Moshe had gone into the tabernacle, the column of the glorious cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the word of Yahuwah spake with Moshe. And you know, Messiah is the word of Yahuwah. And so remember, again, not taking anything from him, because when he speaks, he's literally speaking the words of Yahuwah. And we'll talk more about this face-to-face -face thing and who, who Moshe actually saw. 33.12 and Moshe said unto El Yahuwah, See, you say unto me, Bring up this people, and you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now therefore, I pray you, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way, that I may know you, that I may find grace in your sight, and consider that this nation is your people. And he said, Perchance, I'm sorry, my perchance, my presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. So who went with him? Right? Uh, Isaiah 63, 9. In all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and his pity, he redeemed them, and he bare them and cared them all days of old. I'm here to tell you, I believe Messiah, who has many titles... He's the word, he's the way, he's the truth, um, he's Messiah, he is Adonai, he is the angel of Yahuwah, he's the angel of the presence. Uh, I think he has many titles, and I think this is one of them. And so, my presence shall go with you. All right. Oops. Sorry about that. All right. Verse 15, And he said unto him, If your presence go not with me, carry not us up, up hence. For wherein shall, I, shall it be known here that I and your people have found grace in your sight? Is it not in that I go, I'm sorry, is it not in that you go with us? That's hard to read. So shall we be separated, I and your people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And Yahweh said unto Moshe, I will do this thing also that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. Phew, boy, who wants to be known by name to him? I know I do. And he said, I beseech you, show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of Yahweh before you, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, you cannot see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And Yahweh said, behold, there is a place by me, and you shall stand upon a rock. It shall come to pass, that while my glory passes by, that I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hands while I pass by. And I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. And I'm here to tell you, I believe this is also Messiah and not the Father. And it also reminds me about not being able to see his face. Um, well, his face shines like the sun. You can't look at the sun, can you? Sorry, I'm a terrible actor. But let's take a look at this, because this is important. 
Uh, well, we'll actually we'll talk about it here in a second. Yeah, here, twenty through the end. So we saw, we learned who the presence was. And he said, you cannot see the visage of my face for no man shall see me and abide alive. And Yahweh said, um, behold, a place is prepared before me and you shall stand upon the rock and it shall be that when the, the glory of my presence passes before you, I'll put in the cavern in the rock and will overshadow you with my word until the time I've passed by. And I will make the host of messengers who stand and minister before me to pass by and you shall see my glorious presence Maybe the angel, like the, the angel, the host, the messenger, the angel of his presence. But the face of the glory of my presence you cannot be able to see. I don't know. Interesting. All right, last chapter, 34. We're almost done. 34, 1 through 9. And Yahweh said unto Moshe, Hew you two sapphire stones like unto the first. And I will write upon these sapphires the words that were in the first sapphires which you broke. And be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning unto Mount Sinai, and present yourself there to me in the top of the mount. And no man shall come up with you, neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount, neither let the flocks nor herds feed before that mount. And he hewed two sapphire stones like unto the first, and Moshe rose up early in the morning, and went up to Mount Sinai, as Yahuwah commanded him, and took in his hand the two sapphire stones. And Yahuwah descended in a cloud, and stood with him there, and proclaimed the name of Yahuwah. And Yahuwah passed by before him, and proclaimed Yahuwah. Yahweh El, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. So here is the Father proclaiming himself, right? Or is this Messiah proclaiming the Father? I believe the latter, and I'll, I'll back that up here in a second. Remember, he proclaimed him, right? He's proclaiming Yahuwah. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. And Moshe made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. And he said, If now I found grace in your sight, O Adonai, let my Adonai, I pray you, go among us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us from your inheritance. So let's read about this. Let's read the Targums 5-9. through nine. And Yahweh revealed himself in the cloud of the glory of his presence. And Moshe stood with him there, and Moshe called on the name of the word of Yahuwah. And Yahuwah made his presence, the angel of his presence probably, to pass before his face and proclaimed Yahuwah, Yahuwah Elohim, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and nigh in mercies, abounding to exercise compassion and truth. And the glory of the presence of Yahuwah passed by before him. Right? keeping mercy and bounty for thousands of generations, absolving and remitting guilt, passing by rebellions and covering sins and pardoning them who convert unto the Torah, but holding not guiltless in the great day of judgment those who will not convert, visiting the sins of the fathers upon the rebellious children and upon the third and upon the fourth generation. And... Verse 9, he said, If I have now found mercy before Yahuwah, let the presence of the glory of Yahuwah go among us. For it is a people of hard neck, but pardon you are guilt and our sin and give us the inheritance of the land which you did covenant unto our fathers and change us not to become an alien people. So remember, Yahusha is the angel of the presence. In all their affliction, he was afflicted and the angel of his presence saved them. This is not talking about, in my opinion, this is not talking about Michael or Gabriel or Raphael. And his love and his pity, he redeemed them and bare them and carried them all the days of old. Hebrews 1 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the Father. So our Messiah is the brightness of his glory, he's the glory of his presence, and the express image of his person. And this is why he could say this, John 14, 8 through 11. Philip said unto him, Master, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Yahushua said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and you have not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. Why? Because he is the express image. And how sayest you then, show us the Father? Believe you not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in, in me. He does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. And we know this, Colossians 1, 12 through 19, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, in Torah, who has delivered us from the power of darkness, 
anti-Torah, and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible Elohim, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist, and he is the head of the body of the church, or the, the, the ecclesia, the set-apart assembly, who is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should dwell, should all the fullness dwell. And that's our Messiah. Oh, I missed one thing. Because <clears throat> remember earlier, no, or where did I put that? Oh, here. Next one. Remember, remember, um, uh, and Yahuwah, I believe this is Yahusha, not revealed, descended into clouds, stood with him in there and proclaimed the name of Yahuwah. And he was saying, and Yahuwah, and Yahuwah passed before him and proclaimed Yahuwah, Yahuwah El, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness. So I believe this is Messiah proclaiming Yahuwah. And here is why I believe that more evidence. John one eighteen. No man has seen Elohim at any time. So Moses didn't see him. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Proclaimed or declared the name of Yahuwah. John 6.46 Not that any man has seen the Father, save he which is of Elohim, he has seen the Father. First John 4.12 No man has seen Elohim at any time. If we love one another, Elohim dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. Also, another uh, um, another video or study to look at is who is the angel of Yahuwah. I don't know why these pictures don't work anymore. But we have a video. It's called The Identity of the Angel of Yahuwah. All right. And verse 10. We're going to read verse 10 through 20. And he said, Behold, so the covenant is already renewed at this point, right? And that's what I believe also Messiah did. He renewed the covenant. And he said, Behold, I will cut a covenant before all your people. I will do wonders such as have not been in all the earth nor in any nation. And all the people among you which are shall see the work of Yahuwah, for it is a terrible thing that I will do to you with you. Guard that which I command you this day. Behold, I will drive out before you the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, the Yebusite. Take heed to yourself, lest you cut a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither you go, lest it be a snare in the midst of you. But you shall destroy their altars, break their images, cut down their Asherah poles. For you shall worship no other El, for Yahuwah Kana, Yahuwah is jealous, is my name, for he is a jealous El. Lest you cut a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a whoring after their Elohim, and do sacrifice unto their Elohim, and one call you, and eat of his sacrifice, and take of their daughters unto your sons, and their daughters go a whoring after their Elohim, and make your sons go a whoring after their Elohim. You shall make no molten Elohai. The feast of matzah, unleavened bread, shall you guard. Seven days shall you eat matzah, unleavened bread, as I commanded you. In the month of Abib, of greenery, of green, of renewed, from the month of Abib you came out from Mitzrayim. All that opens the womb is mine. Every firstling among your cattle, whether ox or sheep, that a male is mine. But the firstling of an ass you shall redeem with a lamb, and if you redeem him not, you shall break his neck. All the firstborn of your sons you shall redeem, and none shall appear before me empty. Messiah, our lamb. Is our redemption, and if you're not, if you don't redeem him, you shall break his neck. What happens to people that are not redeemed by the by the Messiah? Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. In earing time and in harvest you shall rest. So it doesn't matter how busy you are at work and how how much you really need to to get the such and such done at work. Put it down. Put your work down on the Shabbat. If you're new, we believe Shabbat starts at sundown on the sixth day of the week, which people call Friday, all the way till sundown uh, on the seventh day of the week, which people call Saturday. And you shall observe the feast of Katsir, harvest of the first fruits of the wheat harvest, and the feast of Asif, and gathering at the year's end. Thrice in the year shall all your male men children appear before Adonai Yahuwah, the Elohai of Yashrael. 
For I will cast out the nations before you, and enlarge your borders. Neither shall any man desire your land. And when you shall go up to appear before Yahweh Elohaika thrice in the year, you shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven. Neither shall the sacrifice of the feast of Pesach be left until the morning. The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of Yahweh Elohaika. You shall not see the kid in his mother's milk. There it is again. And Yahweh said unto Moshe, Write these words. After the tenor of these words, I have cut a covenant with you and with Yashrael. And he was there with Yahuwah forty days and forty nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the sapphires of the words of the covenant, the Ten Debarim, the Ten Commandments. And it came to pass when Moshe came down from the Mount of Sinai with the two sapphires of testimony in Moshe's hand, when he came down from the Mount, that Moshe knew not that the skin of his, the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. When Aharon, just like Messiah, right, like his face shining. And when Aharon and all the children of Yashrael saw Moshe, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. And Moshe called unto them, and Aharon and all the rulers of the assembly returned unto him, and Moshe talked with them. And afterward all the children of Yashrael came nigh, and he gave them in commandment all that Yahweh had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And till Moshe had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But when Moshe went in before Yahuwah to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And he came out and spoke unto the children of Yashrael, which was which he was commanded. And the children of Yashrael saw the face of Moshe, and the skin of Moshe's face shone, and Moshe put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. So, brothers and sisters, I uh, I pray that this uh, Torah portion might have been a blessing for you. A lot to discuss here. This is a pretty deep Torah portion. Right? Stay away from that guy. In any case, um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Yahuwah Most High, we come before you and bless you in Yahushua's name. Thank you for all your due, Father. Thank you for sending your Son to be the Savior of us and for our to be our atonement. Thank you, Father, for his blood that covers us, this true spotless lamb. Father, we thank you for your Shabbats, your feast days, uh, for giving us a heart to mourn after the lost and those who reject your Torah and for all the abominations on this earth. Father, we just pray that you would you would mark us. We don't want to be marked by the world. We don't want to be marked by the evil one. We want to be marked by you. Father, we pray that we are worthy to escape all these things that are coming to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Father, I pray that you would open eyes and ears and the hearts of anyone that would watch these studies or anyone else that is truly serving you, Father, and truly teaching your truth in these last days, that you'd open their heart through these studies or even by just reading the word for themselves, Father, even more so that way. Open the heart of your people, the, the children of Israel, to return back to your service, Father. We love you. Thank you for the Shabbat and all your ways. We love to walk in them. Teach us, trim us, refine us, carve us out as your stones, Father. Yehusha, our Mashiach, we love you and we bless you. Worthy of all praise and honor. In Yehusha's name we do pray. Amen and hallelujah. Shabbat Shalom, brothers and sisters. I'm actually going to play a new song for you. Uh, this is actually performed by our local um, um, worship band at our local Shabbat station. And um, it's called O Yisrael. It's one of our favorite songs. Those of you that were at Sukkot with us, they played this song many times. And he made the, the our worship leaders uh, for music is Lyndon and Ruth. And they do an amazing job at the song called O Yisrael. It's perfect timing for me to play this for you for the first time because it's all about laying down your idols. So I hope you enjoy it. Shabbat Shalom. There is a wrestling in our soul that long to know our Great Adon, as we wander in the wilderness, we lift our cry up to receive His rest. Who is our Elohim? Oh, His voice is calling. Alone, oh, Israel, 
praise him alone. is a wrestling in our soul the long to know our great adorn as we wander in the wilderness we lift our cry up to receive his breath who is our elohim oh his voice is calling who gave his one and only son to make us free and forgiven oh we praise we praise the hell of our core we praise the hell of Shalom, baby. 
upon you. 